Hello YouTube, my name is Miles Anderson. I'm a professional joke explainer, and today I'm explaining the jokes of Miles Anderson, one of the best comedians working today. There's a little intro here then. So I, there's a, already a joke there in the title. Um, <clears throat> the name Miles can be a name, but it can also be uh, a unit of measurement. So uh, very funny stuff already. Thank you so much. Give it go for my body double. <laughs> Risky little riff there on the top. Uh, the host obviously looked very similar to Miles, so the joke there is is that well, Miles would have a body devil, but obviously uh, he wouldn't need one because nobody wants to kill him. Always well, conscious of assassination attempts. Well, maybe one. <laughs> it's so nice to be uh, back here on the island, ladies and gentlemen. It's my homeland. I, I, yeah. I love Vancouver Island so much. I love being surrounded by water. I'm full of chicken strips. I've never felt so good in my life. Guess a little inside joke there. Uh, Miles Anderson is a Canadian comedian, and uh, Canadian comedians are often paid in chicken strips. I, I love the island so much. It is just so much better than everywhere else. It is the best place in the world to live. It really is. And I think that's because the people here are so nice, and everyone is much more calm than on the mainland. And I think that's because you can't just drive straight here angry. You know, you gotta get, you gotta get on a ferry and stare at the ocean for 90 minutes. Really calms you down. I think that's why we have such a low murder rate on the island compared to the mainland. Because, you know, murderers can't drive straight here from Vancouver, you know? A murderer can't come just bombing down the highway towards the island like, Oh man, I'm gonna kill this guy. And then they get to the ferry terminal and they're like, Damn it! They get on the ferry, they're trying to stay angry, they're just pacing up and down on the sun deck. <laughs> There's no way that guy is that good at Call of Duty, he was definitely cheating, and now he's gonna die. <laughs> is that an orca? <sighs> it is beautiful today. By the time they get to Vancouver Island, they're like, ah, I'm just going to scare that guy. I can't do it. It's too nice out here. All right, so I'm not sure uh, where Vancouver Island is, but obviously it's an island. Uh, so the joke there is uh, the, the, the calming effect of the ocean on a person who is going to go to an island to kill somebody. Uh, you know, murder, not really that uh, funny of a subject, but obviously uh, Miles does a great job here. Um, you know, he's a master craftsman. Uh, also, um, <clears throat> you know, I, I personally don't find the ocean calming. I tend to get, uh, you know, I think about uh, a lot of my life and I, I tend to get very upset. Um, but obviously if, for this joke here, it, for most people, the ocean has a calming effect. So that's why the joke is funny. The island is a calm place for, for many reasons, you know. I think another reason, too, is that we have a lot of old money here on Vancouver Island. And old money is very calm, you know. It's a different kind of money. It's a calm money. These rich people have been rich for a long time, and they're never worried about things, you know. In Vancouver, on the mainland, it's full of new money people. They're highly stressed out, you know. You ask a new money person where they got their money, they're like, oh, I have like a hundred Airbnbs and um, the pandemic was insane. I had to sell like three of them so I didn't have to work for a living. It was tough. It's brutal out there. So I'm not sure where Vancouver is. It's, it's the tough thing with Canadian comedians is I don't know uh, any, anything about uh, Canadian locations. So this is going to be really kind of tough for me to explain a lot of these jokes. But uh, so far, so good. I think Vancouver's a big city. On Vancouver Island, you ask, a, you ask an old money person where their money came from, they're like, well, in the Third Crusade. 
My family owned a very successful silk caravan. I don't have to sell any of my Airbnbs. You know, if I, I need money, I just send a raven to the Knights Templar. Well, the pandemic did not concern me. It was foretold in the scrolls. Little technical note here. Uh, first of all, you know, that joke is about old money, which is uh, very funny because, you know, obviously uh, a lot of old money did come from the, the Third Crusade. Um, <clears throat> but uh, there's a little bit of an autofocus uh, problem going on with this particular camera. There was a huge solar flare uh, apparently during the recording of this special, so it was kind of uh, messing with the camera's electronics. You know, when I watch something with bad autofocus, every time it, the camera starts to jitter, I just close my eyes and, uh, and then I just open them every once in a while to see if uh, the camera angle has changed. The uh, only real problem on Vancouver Island is uh, the mountain lions. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but Vancouver Island has the densest population of mountain lions in the world. <laughs> yeah, I guess it's here. <laughs> I guess there's a mountain lion here tonight. Uh, that's how dense the population is. They are in this comedy club right now. Great improv. All the cougars! All the cougars, yes. I knew that was going to happen. Took a huge risk. But yes... Okay, it seems like Miles is kind of moving on from the heckler here, which is unfortunate, you know, uh, I mean, he is a very good comedian, but if he was, you know, even better, generally, if someone yells out in the crowd, you want to spend 15 to 25 minutes on that person. I don't know why he's moving on. It's kind of a golden opportunity. All the best comedians are really hoping that someone's going to yell out, but he obviously just uh, wants to continue on. Um, again, he's one of the best. He might not be the best. We have, we have the densest population of mountain lions in the world. Uh, I don't know how this happened. You know, I guess they keep multiplying and they can't get on the ferry, so they're just <laughs> piling up here. And it's actually such a problem. When, when I was a little kid, I uh, had a conservation officer come to my school and educate the children about the murder cats that were <laughs> lurking behind the playground. Murder cats, very funny word. And I'll never forget what the conservation officer said. He sat down and he was like, you know, kids, you'll probably never see a mountain lion, but statistically, mountain lions have already seen you. <laughs> the scariest thing I'd ever heard in my life. That is, a, that is actually a quite a, it is a scary fact. Uh, if you guys are ever uh, out in the forest and you see a mountain lion, um, always remember to keep facing the mountain lion, pick up a big stick, Act aggressive, do not run away, um, and do not be afraid because mountain lions can smell and detect fear from up to eight miles away. So just be strong, be confident. Just imagine you're on stage at the comedy store just killing and uh, you know the mountain lions will respect you and leave you alone. <laughs> the fear of mountain lions has been burned into me so deeply it is irrational. I live in Vancouver now in the city. And, yeah, uh, you know, I, I went out, I was walking down like a, like a creepy alley the other day and I heard some shuffling behind me and my first thought was the mountain lions. Oh my God. <laughs> they finally found me. And I turned around slowly and it was just some guy with a knife. Like, <laughs> it's so relieved. Thank, thank God he's got a knife in case there's a mountain lion around here, you know? Terrifying. All right, what a classic joke that was. Uh, a great bait and switch. You know, the setup, the fear of the mountain lion. He builds a, a scary scene, and then you think that he's going to say something uh, not scary. You know, like I turn around, and it was just a, it was just a cute little poppy behind me, which would be a relief. But he says it's a guy with a knife behind me, which most people would think was scary if they didn't know about mountain lions and mountain lions famously have uh, 10 knives attached to their body which is far more frightening so uh, it's kind of a joke about the ignorance of a of a rural country bumpkin moving to the big city and and not knowing quite what to be afraid of 
Uh, so really great, really great joke there. Yeah, but generally island problems are uh, very different than uh, mainland problems. I met a friend for coffee in Vancouver a few months ago, and he arrived late to the coffee, and uh, he was all shooken up and, uh, you know, kind of trembly. And I was like, hey, man, what happened? And he was like, some guy tried to mug me, but I managed to fight him off. And I was like, oh, my God, that's terrifying. And then when I visited my grandmother on rural Vancouver Island a few weeks ago, I... Uh, I, I, I knocked on her door and she came to the door and she had the same like traumatized, like trembly look in her face. I was like, oh my God, Grandma, what happened? She was like, there's just too many hummingbirds. I can't feed them all. I... <laughs> all right, so great little, another little joke there, but a lot of jokes about Vancouver Island. Uh, if, before you watch the special, if you haven't watched it yet, just pull up Google Maps, look up Vancouver Island, and then put the satellite view on there, get a real lay of the land of what it looks like, uh, and then look up Vancouver as well. I think those are two locations you're gonna need there. This is a lot of location-based comedy in this first bit here, uh, which is super smart because he's taping this on Vancouver Island. So when you got jokes about Vancouver Island on Vancouver Island, really smart move. Um, you just have to hope that um, the, the world knows where this is. Nightmare. <laughs> I I was uh, I was raised by hillbillies on the island. I know uh, it's hard to imagine. I have very good posture, but I <laughs> I was raised by rednecks. And uh, a few years ago, uh, a relative of mine uh, he died, and I inherited all of his guns. <laughs> <And> <laughs> Laughing at his own joke there, that's really important to do. Um, all the best comedians do it. Um, you laugh at your joke, then the audience knows it's a joke, and they will laugh. And I thought, oh, that's kind of cool. I guess it'll be fun, you know, I could just add some blast into my life. And um, I went to the rifle range, and uh, I, I can't really enjoy guns uh, because the ammunition is so expensive. I can't have a good time. Like, I sit at the rifle range and the only thing going through my head is I'm like, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar. Oh, there's a, there's a big one, eh? Well, that's pretty cool. That's a three dollars. Oh. oh. So that's kind of a funny joke there, thinking uh, he's so poor that he's thinking about how much the ammo costs. Also, you know, the guns changed mid act out, which was also funny. You know, you had the you had the first it cocked the shotgun, and then it just went semi-automatic after that, which is obviously not how firearms work. Um, if you guys want to know how firearms work, check out our our uh, gun channel. What a man, nice coffee. It's also kind of funny too to imagine Miles here at the rifle range because I'm not sure, but I think he might be gay, just sort of based on how he moves around on stage, but. Uh, very funny stuff. And I can't really, you know, you can't have guns for self-defense in Canada. It doesn't work that way here. Uh, you know, if you have guns at your place, you have to have them locked behind layers of security. You can't, it would be impossible if someone broke into my apartment. It would take me a long time to get to the guns. So if someone breaks into my apartment, I basically have to monologue like a Bond villain. <laughs> Like if someone smashes into my apartment, I'm going to have to be like, <gasps> get a glass of wine, walk into the living room. <laughs> ah, noble thief. <laughs> well done. <laughs> you have breached my security. <laughs> what a fool I was thinking a sliding glass door would be enough. Great act out here. Now, before you beat me senseless and burgle my belongings, I thought I may toast you man to man. Now, my most expensive brandy I keep in that uh, tall safe there in the corner, so if you don't mind, I will get our toast prepared here. You have done well tonight, 
I didn't even hear you come in, and I think you should be quite proud of yourself. I would say your burglary was almost flawless, sir. Your only mistake being that you allowed me to talk for this long. A dollar, a dollar, a dollar, a dollar! Three dollars! All right, so that joke there was kind of um, a joke about the absurdity of gun control laws in Canada. Uh, and how hard it, they make it for you to uh, use your firearms to uh, just waste people who uh, are on your property. And of course, in the United States, it's a lot more fair. Uh, everybody there knows that as soon as you cross the, uh, the threshold border onto someone's property uninvited, um, you are then subjugated to lethal force, which obviously is a lot more reasonable because, you know, if you have guns, you know, you, you need to know you can use them almost in any situation, but obviously in Canada here, they're quite restricted. So it's very funny to imagine a whole country of, of uh, people with their guns just totally locked up like complete cuckolds. So very funny. <laughs> well, very strange way to sip ginger ale. Uh, I haven't seen a comedian sip ginger ale like that before. I don't know if that's a bit, or I don't know if Miles uh, has some sort of mental uh, disorder. I am a, I'm a very good grandson, um, <laughs> as all island boys are. Strange segue there. There's a lot of grandparents here. <laughs> and, uh... I follow my grandma all the time, and my grandma is very funny. She's 96 years old, and she has a very dark sense of humor, and she always giggles after she says something horrifying. <laughs> like, almost every time we end our phone call, I'll be like, okay, grandma, I'll talk to you soon. And she's like, probably not. <laughs> Great act out there. If you, know, if you knew Miles' grandma, you'd know that's a perfect impression. All right. She's a very nice lady. Whenever we talk on the phone, she would always talk about, like, she'd moved into a, uh, a retirement home in the last few years, and she would always talk about um, the dinners they have there. She loves the food so much, and so I uh, went to go visit her in the retirement home, and uh, I was in a room, and I saw a laminated uh, folder that said DNR on it, and I thought, oh, DNR, that's short for dinner. And, uh, <laughs> like, dinner, this smells dinner. I was like, Grandma, is that your dinner menu? She's like, no, it means do not resuscitate. <laughs> that was an acronym I, joke I love there. talking to my grandma, though. 96 years old, she's got a lot of amazing perspective on world events. I always like to get her opinion on things going on in the news. And uh, I asked her, I said, uh, like, Grandma, how does, the, how does the pandemic compare to other things you've lived through? Like, was it... Uh, was it worse that, like, what, what was it like compared to World War II? And she was like, oh, it was so much worse. And I was like, what? <laughs> How was the pandemic worse than World War II? And she was like, oh, you know, World War II made sense. The pandemic was very confusing. <laughs> and I thought, you know, that's kind of a fair point, honestly. Like, World War II is a huge tragedy, but it is a very simple story, you know? You've got, like... Hitler and the team of evil boys that's like the worst villains of all time on one side and then the other side you've got like Tom Hanks and the band of brothers <laughs> and all the greatest heroes and when the war ends you know every newspaper in the world is like the war is over and then you know if you're white you get a Cadillac and a house it's like <laughs> pretty awesome like I don't think we would think of World War II uh, the Band of Brothers, Tom Hanks, that movie, uh, that, that TV show came out about 45 years ago. So a great little bit of name comedy there. With the same reference for the story, if World War II ended like the pandemic ended, right? Like one year in 1945, all the newspapers in the world are like, there's 85% less World War II this year than... I think we're going to call it. It's probably done about... Just feel free to travel.
We didn't find Hitler, he's out there somewhere. We are monitoring the situation. All right, so that joke there is about the uh, trouble uh, communicating the end of the pandemic, which we all know is 98% uh, completed. Um, so a great little, little observation there. Also worked in World War II, which is a great thing to work into an act. Everybody knows and loves World War II uh, material. So a little bit of history comedy, name comedy in there. Um, it's funny because, uh, you know, we all know that the pandemic ended um, in uh, as soon as um, uh, Florida State declared it over. Um, but Miles here is obviously was confused for a little while longer. <laughs> a lot of people uh, revenge traveling this year. I heard that term. I hated that term. The news is saying everybody's revenge traveling for the travel they didn't get to do in the pandemic. And that sounds terrible, having a revenge holiday. Uh, I don't think you have to tra travel with revenge in your heart. Like all these people going to the Grand Canyon, like, look at the stupid cliffs! I was supposed to be here a year ago! Get in the truck! <laughs> look at Yellowstone National Park, it's a year older than it's supposed to be! 2020 was the best year for geysers! So that uh, joke there is about the thought of traveling angry, um, which is, of course, uh, how most people travel. So it is kind of funny that Miles is uh, implying that that would be an odd thing to do and that it would feel bad. But if, you, if you've met tourists, most tourists are uh, full of rage and uh, very upset at all times. So <laughs> I think, you know, it worked, this joke kind of works in this context on, on, I guess, in a Vancouver Island setting. But... Um, it's not really a funny observation, I think, because, you know, most people are upset when they travel. <laughs> Traveling is very popular these days. There's a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of influencers, a lot of rich influencers always posting about traveling. They always say they're going on an adventure. But they're all these rich people. Like, traveling is not an adventure if you're wealthy. Like, it's just a seamless series of events. <laughs> You want to go on an adventure when you travel, travel poor, <laughs> like you'll have the biggest adventure of your life. Try and live in Europe for three months on a budget of a thousand dollars. You're going to rent an Airbnb in Romania that's like, um, if you're going to stay here, no garlic, no crucifixes. <laughs> it's like a dollar a night, no problem. That's a joke about, uh, va that's a vampire joke there, so, uh, vampires were uh, monsters that lived in Eastern Europe in, uh, you know, about 100 to 150 years ago. There was a big vampire epidemic in, in Europe, but um, obviously most of them are gone now. There's maybe less than a handful left, and they do sometimes rent Airbnbs. So it's kind of funny to imagine, you know, Miles going to Europe and accidentally renting from one of these uh, famous vampires. But... Uh, you know, Miles is very, you notice here he giggles a lot. He's really enjoying himself. Sometimes a lot of the jokes here are just that he's having a good time and he hopes that you're having a good time. You know, he's a lot of good time comedy as well. I was fortunate to, to travel right out of high school. I lived in France for a little while. That was cool. Um, it was interesting living in France. You know, I don't, I don't speak uh, French at all, which makes it tough. Um, they speak French like all day there. <laughs> it's very humiliating not speaking the, the language. You know, I basically had to be Mr. Bean to get my point across. Mr. Bean, very famous. I had to get a Bean. haircut in France. And I walked into the barber shop like, oh, snip, snip, oh. Perfect Mr. Bean impression. Great stuff. Yeah, Small Rowan Atkinson. Break for the people who know Mr. Bean. But yeah, people travel for all sorts of different reasons. You know, some people uh, travel because they want to find out things about different cultures. They want to find out things about themselves. But when you actually go traveling, you learn that all you find is Australians. And um, very true observation. <laughs> You could go to a, a, a remote mountain village in Nepal and be watching the sunset and like softly in the distance you'll just hear like, beautiful. 
left. I knew it. Great, great opportunity to do an accent. Always do the accent if you have an opportunity to do it. So funny, Australian sound, so different than us. They just sound so dumb uh, that we just have to laugh when we hear an Australian accent. So great joke there. And I don't, I don't blame it on the Australians. It's just part of their life cycle. They're just not like other people, you know? Like they, they spawn in Australia. They're almost like salmon, right? They spawn in Australia. As soon as they're strong enough, they leave to like go collect work visas and PR cards. And then when they're ready to reproduce, they return to Australia. Because they have to make sure their weird accent continues forever, you know? Can't lose it. Raising their little kids like, remember, it's pronounced no. Okay. <laughs> Proud really agree with that one there. Another great opportunity to do an accent. So a lot of the joke here is about how Australians are different and strange. Uh, very funny observation. I, uh... I lived with my grandparents for a long time here in Victoria, and uh, it was they loved having me live there. Uh, no idea where Victoria is, but I assume it's on Vancouver Island, which I assume is near Vancouver. Um, I was like in-home tech support for them at all times, <laughs> and they loved that a lot. Uh, my grandpa is uh, very bad with computers, and uh, I'd always go into his office, and I swear he had so many viruses on his computer, like the webcam would like follow me across the room. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, the joke there is about a specific computer virus that came out in 2003. Um, you could access it via LimeWire if you tried to uh, download the soundtrack to the Titanic and you would get it on your computer and it would make your uh, webcams turn on and film you. But I always thought it was so interesting that he struggled so much with modern technology when the technology he grew up with is infinitely more complicated than what we have now. Everything now is all very intuitive. He showed me how to uh, start his old tractor once, and it was like an 11 step process. So you gotta put a little bit of fuel in the cylinder, pull the choke up, make sure it's in turtle mode. Sometimes if the battery's dead, you gotta like jump it on a hill. <laughs> like, Grandpa, you know how you start an iPad? You look at it, you just look at it. Great observation. Why does this blow your mind? <laughs> and my grandpa could fix anything too. He could fix his old tractor. He could like just hear it. He could be like, oh, it sounds like the clutch is slipping. Oh, it sounds like the cam chain needs tensioning. I'm like, grandpa, you know how you fix an iPad? You turn it off and turn it on. <laughs> Three times, and if that doesn't work, you throw in the garbage, you buy a new one. <laughs> so much easier. Crowd didn't like that joke. A lot of crowds don't like it uh, when you, you make a joke about um, uh, excessive waste uh, because obviously we live in a consumer society and uh, we love to buy things and then throw it in the Pacific Ocean. So it's really important uh, when you're doing comedy to kind of step away from that and you know, keep it light. Don't mention our sins um, unless it's very, very funny. And obviously that joke didn't hit as hard because it wasn't as funny as it could have been. Um, if Miles, you know, again, he's one of the best, but if he was the best comedian uh, working today, you know, he probably would have found someone in the crowd that wasn't laughing and just berated them for um, 10 or 15 minutes and really kind of saved that joke. But he's just sort of moving on to the next thing here, uh, which is unfortunate. Yeah, I remember once uh, <laughs> I was uh, upstairs, I heard my grandma freaking out downstairs. And I was like, oh my god, what's going on, Grandma? Are the hummingbirds aggressive again? And she's like, no. Great callback. She's like, no, Miles, we, we have to go to the mall right now. The, the government's on the phone. They say I'm behind on my taxes, and I need to send Google Play gift cards to India. And I was like, Grandma, we are not going to the mall, okay? You can buy those online now. Let me show you how to do it. How much do you need? <laughs> okay, there's a joke about uh, Miles' grandmother being incompetent with technology and she doesn't know how to pay her taxes. She thinks that she has to go to the mall to get Google Play gift cards with Miles very funnily 
points out that you can actually buy those gift cards online now. Uh, if you guys didn't know that, make sure that if, if someone phones you online, they need Google Play gift cards. You know, you don't want to get behind on your taxes. Make sure you buy those things. You can buy them all online, have them mailed to your house, and then you can forward them to the mailing address that the government needs them. So make sure you guys do that. I'm definitely, I, I definitely am a curmudgeon though. I don't like new tech. I think there's a, there was a line that happened somewhere where we used to use technology. Now technology just uses us and it's very annoying. You know, I also like, I, I also kind of feel like a weird old hermit now because, you know, I go around, like I remember how it felt to have my brain destroyed by my phone. I'm old enough to remember my pre-phone brain and just how smart I was back then. <laughs> You know, I walk around like a weird old hermit now, like warning young people, like, oh, don't spend too much time on your phone there. I remember back in 2004, I used to have one thought for minutes and minutes and minutes. Oh, boy. Great act out. I really used to get to the bottom of stuff back then. Uh, <laughs> that joke is, uh, Sort of about imagining Miles being an old person, which is very, very funny, because um, uh, he doesn't really suit being an old man. It's tough. It's uh, it's totally it's totally ruined my brain. I don't like the algorithmically recommended video feeds. I don't like that. I miss uh, television. I miss everybody watching the same TV shows at the same time. You know, it was like a cultural experience. Everyone's watching the same stuff. The next day you could talk about the same episode of Frasier you all watched. You're like, oh, isn't that a fun time? Now it's very weird. It could almost be awkward, you know? Like I'll be, I'll meet a group of friends. I'll be like, hey guys, yeah, well, how about those uh, algorithm videos last night? A lot of weird Nazi stuff in there, am I right, guys? Like, oh. <laughs> we don't get those videos. <laughs> okay, that, there, that's a joke about um, Miles getting a lot of neo-Nazi content um, recommended to him uh, and none of his friends don't get it and uh, you know that's, that's kind of a funny joke because I think I could totally relate to that because I you know I spent a lot of my time watching some of the best comedy on the internet and I tend to get a lot of recommendations for white supremacist uh, enthusiasts and uh, so that's kind of a funny joke because I don't want that content, but that content finds me for some reason. And the mystery of the algorithm is, is kind of the, the, the main joke there. Well, they're very interesting. My sister, she loves, uh, she loves TikTok. She's addicted to TikTok. I don't like TikTok. I think that's the moment I became old, was I said those words out loud. I said, what is TikTok? And both my knees popped. <laughs> <laughs> but she loves it, and I don't like it. I don't like random videos being just shotgunned at me as I'm sitting on this. It's very disorienting. And she's like, Miles, like, you just have to use it a whole bunch and then it knows what you like and it shows you better videos. And I'm like, you know how terrifying that sounds to me? Like you're basically saying, Miles, don't resist the machine, let it learn your mind. <laughs> and it will show you the ads you've always wanted. It's kind of funny that Miles Anderson will be making this joke um, because uh, as a comedian, as a stand-up comedian, I know that he is very big on TikTok. I think he has over, I think, 600 followers on TikTok. So it's funny that he's making fun of TikTok when TikTok is, you know, sort of the meat and potatoes of how he makes his money. I can't stand it. And I hate getting pushed to new tech all the time. You're always getting pushed to new tech. I remember VR was a huge... VR was like the flavor of the year for so long, and it's so stupid because they've never been able to solve the fundamental problem of virtual reality, which is walking around. <laughs> uh, and it's crazy because all these tech bros spend billions and billions of dollars trying to solve this, when the simplest solution is right there, you know, just put every main character in the video game that you play as, they're in a wheelchair. Like, it's simple. It's a simple solution. Like, imagine 
You know, you could have like the new Call of Duty game, you know, it's like World War II beaches in Normandy, and all the machine guns are blasted, and then like a landing craft comes to the beach, the ramp slams down, and you, as the player, roll out as FDR. Like, <laughs> big cigarette in your mouth, like Tommy Gunn, who ordered the New Deal? A lot of name comedy in that joke there. Uh, a lot of gambling on Miles' part, hoping that people understand that FDR is, a, is an acronym for uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt and that the New Deal was a famous piece of legislation that he passed. Uh, I think uh, Miles may have been drawing too much material from his pre-phone brain uh, for that joke there, but uh, the crowd loves it, so it is funny. I love when people pull back when I say that joke, like, whoa, 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 there's no heroes in wheelchairs. No, we can't have that. No. We're a very mean group of people. We don't... We are not inclusive here. Get him, Miles. It's always, uh... Yeah, I, I, when I was growing up, I played so many video games, just obsessed with video games, me and my brothers. I have uh, two younger brothers, and little boys are stupid. We are obsessed with war. I don't know what it is with little boys and going to conflict with each other all the time, but I grew up playing war video games, obsessed with war, and I think it's so sad that a lot of the world's wars are fought by teenage boys. Like, from a, from a human perspective, it's, it's tragic, but from a tactical perspective, it kind of makes sense. Like... <laughs> Teen boys are the dumbest, most aggressive people on earth. They heal instantly, and they stay up all night long. Like, it's pretty much everything you'd want in a super soldier. I would never want to fight an army of teenage boys. It would be impossible. I'd be standing there in a trench with my binoculars, like, looking out, and I, I'm like, oh, dear God, I see a huge like, cloud of vape in the distance. <laughs> Uh, Jonathan, do you see uh, do you see the vape cloud? Yeah, we got the uh, teen division. Oh my God, they move so fast, and they're wearing flip flops. How is this possible? It looks like they've tucked their their pants into their socks or something. Why? Why do they do that? Oh dear God. Oh, they're, they're, they're pointing at me. <laughs> what are they saying? Do you know what they're saying, Johnson? They say my binoculars are cringe? <laughs> All right, there. So the joke there is about the, how hard it would be to fight an army of teenage boys. Uh, and it would be difficult, you know, that is the joke. I know I've thought about it many times, how I would defeat um, a whole division of teens. And um, honestly, you would just sort of hope that they can't stay focused for more than 15 seconds at a time, but they obviously will outrun you and uh, stay up much later than you. So uh, it is a funny, it's a funny joke to imagine the scene and Miles has a great act out there, really fully goes into it, but in, uh, it actually is a serious thing to think about and consider in, in case a war happens, uh, how you would have to feat, uh, fight such, um, such youthful, angry uh, people. I'm in my 30s and it's funny when I turned 30, everyone started acting all smug around me. You know, they're always like, they're always like oh, you feel old now, Miles? You feel old? And I'm like, no, I don't. You know, I don't really feel old because I'm in my 30s. I, I remember the day I felt old was the day I graduated university and had to do a job. <laughs> that was when the old happened. It's like crazy how that day of this is my life now like hits you like a ton of bricks, you know? That's why I understand like why, you know, when you're in, when you're in school, it, it's funny when you're a student because you represent potential all the time. When you're a student, it's the lo loveliest time because anything could happen. You could be anything, do anything. As soon as you graduate school, this is what you are forever now. <laughs> it's a terrible feeling. That's why my advice to younger kids would be stay in school forever. <laughs> Never leave. Imagine that awesome. I, I wish I had just stayed in school forever. I was still there. I was just doing PhD after PhD. Imagine if I died, you know, when I'm 84 years old, I've got seven doctorate degrees, three million dollars of debt. 
There'd be a whole page of the newspaper dedicated to me. They'd be like, man with unlimited potential. <laughs> Died today. He was gonna change the world if only he ever graduated. <laughs> we can only imagine what he would achieve. Okay, so that joke is, uh, uh, again, um, the joke there is, is, is very funny because Miles is implying that when you graduate, uh, you get a job and that's what you do uh, for the rest of your life and that makes you feel old. Um, and obviously the joke is that that's, that's not true. Um, you know, most people who are millennials and Gen Z, if you get a job, uh, you'll work at that job for three years maximum before you are uh, either laid off uh, or replaced by a robot or you quit um, because you can't handle um, the incredible amount of uh, stress that the job is putting on your body. So uh, again, it's kind of an old, almost like an old timey bit, like a classic comedy bit, and maybe a comedian would have been able to do in the 60s when the uh, economy was stable. Um, but this joke doesn't really work now, um, or it kind of does as a classic comedy throwback bit, which I think the crowd is, is understanding that uh, juxtaposition um, between the two economies that uh, Miles is kind of making fun of here satirically. But yeah, I, uh... I don't know. I, I, my other, my older friends too, who are in their thirties already, were very smug. They were saying things to me that like, "Oh, you're in your thirties now. <laughs> well, buckle up because you know when I was in my twenties, you know I could drink all night long, and the next day I'd feel totally fine. But now that I'm in my thirties and I drink too much, like the next day, like my gums bleed, I can't feel my legs, and I'm like, I don't think you have re age-related medical problems. Uh, I think you have scurvy." Um, <laughs> Maybe have a lime. <laughs> the joke there is just for the word scurvy. It's a very funny, old-timey word. The crowd recognizes this, and they laugh. My friends are starting to uh, talk, you know, in their 30s, they're starting to make big life decisions. There's a lot of pressure to make life decisions. And uh, a lot of my friends who make some money are like thinking about retirement and uh, I can't afford to retire, to retire so I, that's, that's nice, I don't have to worry about it. Um, <laughs> it's one less thing, you know? I'm in, my, I'm in my 30s now, I'm 32 years old and I do not have a brand. It's horrible to be brandless at this age. I don't know what my brand is, I think it's just sort of generally disappointing. I, <laughs> Because it's, I'm a disappointing person because people see me, they assume I have money, but I'm actually poor. Very sad. People assume I'm rich because I have, a, I have like a resting rich face. And... <laughs> I do. Well, I don't know if you noticed they're there, but the audience members uh, kind of switched out. Um, it's kind of hard to, um, to detect sometimes, but a lot of the best comedians They'll cut between two different uh, takes or two different stand-up specials that are filmed. Um, I know here that Miles Anderson actually filmed, uh, I think, 58 of these uh, t recordings, and then he cut between the 58 specials uh, to make this one special here absolutely perfect. And it's, it's terrible because I also feel like I should be rich. Like I. <laughs> I think that would be the natural way of things. Like, I, I identify as a rich person even though I'm poor. I think I have economic dysmorphia. I do, I do not identify with my bank account at all. Every time I check my banking app, I'm like, this isn't me. Doesn't feel right at all. It sucks though, you know, I'll meet a group of new people, they assume I might be a rich guy, you know, they get all excited and then I'll say something and I'll just blow the whole illusion by saying something only a poor person would say. I'll be like, hey, can I get a ride with you guys? <laughs> this guy sucks. <laughs> but yeah, my friends, a lot of my friends are, you know, they're starting to have kids now. So Miles, obviously not a very good, uh, not very much of a business comedian. Um, he's, uh, sort of, uh, again, he's, he's in Canada, so not a lot of money going around. I think that Canada has between one and 200,000, uh, comedians, and they all share, uh, the same government grant that is, uh, distributed, which is about, uh, I think $10,000. So 
it's uh, very tricky, so he just does it for the love of chicken strips. Oh, and uh, they asked me if I want to have kids, and I'm like, that's a very complicated question, because uh, I want to have a very specific kind of kid. Like, I want to have rich kids. And... <laughs> I can only make poor little orphans right now. And, uh... <laughs> like, I don't want to have to put them through that. It's awful, you know? I'll take it from first-hand experience. My mom's poor. She made me. It's terrible. I gotta work for a living? What a nightmare. That's why, you know, I am a huge uh, advocate for universal basic income, you know? Because I was brought to life against my will, and I should be compensated for it. <laughs> Okay, so obviously Miles is a, a kind of a, a lib cuck, which is uh, unfortunate, <laughs> but he's still very funny, and you can laugh at people across uh, political spectrums, I believe. Um, universal basic income uh, that he's talking about is like a communist uh, propaganda scheme that ensures that um, people don't run out of food um, or a place to live, which is obviously... Uh, uh, not good because um, people are people are not born against their will, like Miles implies here, which is you know just a ridiculous thought. God chooses you, and you're like a big. Uh, there's like a big, um, uh, like a big bowl full of souls, and and then he picks one, and then he puts it inside a person, and then that person is born. And God already knows the job you're gonna do. Like he thinks he's like, oh, I know this guy's gonna do IT. He takes a soul out of the bowl and puts a little IT professional into a person. So that is, um, you know, Miles obviously doesn't understand this, and he's very liberal, uh, but the joke is funny for any side, because if you're, if you're me, you can laugh at how silly he is at his beliefs, and if you're a liberal, you could just clap and agree. So it's the perfect, uh, perfect joke. I didn't choose this. But yeah, it's, I don't know, like, I, th I think about it a lot, and, uh, you know, kids, kids are honestly, like, kind of a huge flex. Like, it's almost ostentatious to make a kid now. Like, kids are not for normal people. It's for, like, the ultra-rich have children, because they're so expensive. Like, when I am in a restaurant and I hear someone's kid freaking out, I get mad in the same way as when I hear someone revving their Ferrari in Vancouver. Like... <laughs> I'll be sitting at my table like, I mean, we get it, you have money, please make your kids be quiet. Stop bragging in this restaurant. Kids are very expensive. <laughs> you can't just have a, a, you can't just raise a normal child anymore. You can't just like have a good person. That's not good enough. You have to optimize a child for the global economy now. You can't, you cannot slack. If your kid doesn't make the Forbes top 10 under 10, <laughs> oh, ho, ho. Not a lot of options. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I, uh, it's funny though, because I still have like a primal urge to reproduce that comes out every once in a while, you know? <laughs> like I'll, uh, I remember I was a few months ago, I was very, very sick and I had a really bad fever and I was lying <laughs> in bed with a fever and I was just like, I told my girlfriend, I was like, bring me my son. <laughs> hey, he's not gay. Give him my USB stick, it has all my saved games on it. <laughs> Tell him to continue my legacy. <laughs> she was like, I will get you an Advil, I'll do that. Okay, so the joke there was kind of a long setup. Um, the whole first half of this special, you're thinking, is he gay? Maybe he probably, by this point, you're like, probably, he's probably gay, and then he says, my girlfriend at this point. So you're like, oh, oh, he's not gay. So that's kind of the joke there is, you know, is he's kind of, you know, he's finally answering the question that everybody's been thinking. <laughs> and of course, I mean, either a way, it's, you know, it's a totally It's a huge decision to make. Great. It's a lot of, uh, it's a lot of financial and emotional resources to spend. And you never know how the kid's going to turn out. It's kind of a huge gamble. Imagine spending all this money and time raising a kid and they just grow up to be a comedian. Like, my God. <laughs> What a disaster. <laughs> Self-deprecating joke there. Not great when you're brand building. Uh, again, Miles isn't a very good business comedian. A lot of the time uh, when you're doing comedy, you don't really want to make fun of yourself because you really want people to buy your stand-up and identify you 
to identify with you as a huge winner. If you make fun of yourself as being kind of a loser, um, you know, you're not going to be able to build up that business comedy as, as much. So ki kind of risky, but again, Miles is a, a Canadian. I have a, I, I'm very lucky. I have a very lovely uh, partner that I live with in Vancouver. Partner is a very millennial term. We invented that term. We can take that for ourselves. The millennials, we invented partner. And I love it. I love the term partner. I remember when I was in high school, I thought it would be really nice to have a girlfriend. Uh, and then when I graduated and saw how expensive everything was, I was like, I need a partner. I definitely need a partner for this. Um, <laughs> Like, it's kind, of, it's kind of romantic, too. It's kind of a romantic term. It's almost like, you know, it implies, like, if I go down, you go down with me. Like, <laughs> let's go out of business together. But yeah, I have a very lovely partner. She's very nice. And uh, we, we took a long time uh, to, you know, get together. It was like a long process before we eventually committed to a relationship. And I think that that is a smart, cautious way to go. You know, relationships are very scary. I think they should be approached in the same way you would approach exploring an unexplored cave. You know, you have to have the same system. You want to have, like, a, a constant contact with your friend group on the outside. And, like, you want to tie a rope around your waist and give it to all your best buds. And you just, like, slowly lower yourself into the relationship. Maintaining constant contact with the surface, you know, you just sort of start going into the cave and you're like, what do you guys, uh, what do you guys think of her? And they're like, dude, she's so cool. You should go another couple hundred feet in. You guys are, you guys are awesome together. <laughs> well, we're about uh, 300 feet down. There's a lot of bats down here and there's a lot of bats. Oh my gosh. We'll save you. You know, I think that's the way you should approach a relationship, but everybody's got that one friend that's like, is that a cave? And they just dive. <laughs> you don't hear from them for eight years. And then they wash up somewhere on the beach. They cough up a wedding ring like, what was that? <laughs> So that's a joke about uh, committing too early uh, to relationships, um, uh, you know, which is uh, a funny joke because obviously you shouldn't do that. It could be dangerous. Uh, you know, some of the people I, I look to for relationship advice, I, th I think of people like Chris D'Elia, you know, he sampled, you know, many dozens of very young women before he decided on, on exactly what he wanted to uh, what he wanted to do. And I'm not sure if he's married yet or not, but I, you know, I, res I, I think that the sample is that what all, a lot of the best comedians do is uh, they tend to just, you know, try and get to the entire female population before they, they settle on one person. I, uh, I have many jobs. I work at a museum in Vancouver as well. That's very interesting, working at a museum. Uh, I work at the front desk. It's a very don't uh, care job. It's amazing. I don't have to do anything there. I, l I finished the whole internet last week. I got to the very bottom of the whole thing. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, it's amazing working where there's no stakes, you know? Like, I never try even slightly at my job. You know, some people approach the desk with, like, weird coupons. They're like, uh, you know, I, I, it's a two-for-one, but there's three of us. I'm like, it's free for all of you. I can't do that math. Like, that's... <laughs> what a genius. A little bit of a math joke there. There's a couple awkward discounts I administer, though. Uh, at the seniors discount is always awkward. You know, you don't want to just assume someone's old. You know, you don't want to have, like, a wrinkle scale in your head and just assume someone is a senior, they might get offended. So I always ask, like, I might ask some leading questions to find out if they're old. I'll be like, hey, so do you, uh, do you own a house? <laughs> <laughs> and when they're like, oh, wow, I do actually. I'm like, well, it's also cheaper for you today as well. <laughs> wow, pretty great. That's kind of a joke about um, uh, older people having uh, a lot of asset wealth in their property. Uh, the old days, the seniors' discounts were based on, um, you know, seniors would have a fixed pension income, 
and that was a lot of how they'd afford things. But now, obviously, seniors, if they have a pension, they also have a fixed income of uh, the value of their house going up by $40,000 a year as well. So the, uh, the joke there is sort of for the, the senior discount is outdated now. The most awkward discount I, I administer, though, is definitely the discount for indigenous people. They do not pay to go into the museum, but they don't advertise this at the front desk. So in Canadian, in the Canadian language, indigenous people means uh, Native American. So I'm stuck in a situation where I want to make sure indigenous people don't pay to go in, but I also don't want to ask what race people are at the front desk. Because <laughs> I look like I would do that. And... Another self-burn there. Like I don't, I don't want to be sitting there like, oh, excuse me, sir, are you indigenous? And he's like, oh, actually, no, I'm Mexican. I'm like, full price for Mexicans. <laughs> Obviously, that would be an embarrassing thing to say. That's kind of a joke there. I, uh, I did my degree in music, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, yeah, sure, yeah. Oh, well, yeah, I will be poor forever. Um, <laughs> it's tough, it's tough, you know. It's tough having a degree in music and applying for jobs because I always have to apply for, like, the lowest tier job at a place because I don't really have any skills, you know, and it's, uh, it's tough to not be sarcastic because a lot of these very low-level positions still want you to prove that you're like physically, spiritually, emotionally dedicated to this stupid job for money. And it can be very tough for me. I'll be sitting in an interview and they're like, uh, so Miles, why do you want to work here? And I'm like, well, you know, uh, in my fourth year of music school, I was listening to the late Beethoven string quartets and I was so deeply moved by the music that I, I realized my true calling in life is shipping and receiving, so... <laughs> Yes, I am forklift certified. <laughs> Shipping and receiving is a, it's a funny punchline because it's the uh, often the lowest uh, tier job at any place. Um, you never want to work in shipping and receiving. Um, if any of you guys watch this video work in shipping and receiving, um, congratulations on your uh, degree in music. And I hope that, you know, maybe one day we can play something together. I do, uh, I do teach piano lessons as well. Uh, if you're interested, please let me know. <laughs> and uh, it's interesting teaching uh, lots of different kids. Uh, I teach a lot of rich kids piano, and uh, it's, it's funny, you know, I can spot a rich kid from so far away. It's just crazy, because you just notice they look so healthy. Like, it's crazy <laughs> how healthy rich kids are. Like, they just, their hair is so full of vitamins and minerals. It's true. Like, I wouldn't eat one, but I would, like... <laughs> but maybe, like, a one bite. <laughs> it's very hard. It's very hard to uh, teach rich kids piano, because they don't respect me at all, because they know that their, their dad can buy and sell me. Um, <laughs> It's very hard to intimidate them, you know? And it's like, uh, I remember I saw a teacher this one kid and he, he literally said, are we done here? <laughs> and I uh, took a deep breath and I was like, how am I gonna scare this kid into uh, being afraid of me? And I was like, you know, um, you'll probably uh, never actually see a mountain lion, but... Uh... Great callback. Crowd recognizes the callback. Big applause break. One of the best. <laughs> Another kind of kid I teach. I, public school kids can be very difficult to teach because they don't have any attention span. Uh, you know, they've been, uh, they're, not, they're not easy to scare either because they've been in gen pop for so long. <laughs> gen pop is a prison so I, I reference. Can't, I can't scare them into practice. I was teaching one public school kid uh, something on the piano, and he just laughed in my face like the Joker. I was like, oh, you have to play here on the music, and then he was just like, <laughs> I was like, what is funny that happened? 
And he's like, oh, nothing. I was just thinking about a YouTube video from earlier today. <laughs> I was like, you're watching YouTube right now in your brain? <laughs> like, can you put some piano lessons in there? My favorite kids to teach, though, uh, for sure, are uh, homeschooled kids. It's just an absolute delight to teach homeschooled kids. They're very easy to intimidate. Uh... It's true. Home homeschooled kids, great premise for a joke. You know, homeschooled kids, you know, are very funny. Uh, you know, what they look like, sound like, what their names are. All around a very funny topic here. So this, I'm excited for this. It usually goes something like this. I'll be like, uh, have a seat at the piano, Abraham. Uh, Great name. Bless you and your waist long hair. <laughs> now, I, uh, I noticed you didn't practice last week. And uh, if you don't practice this week, I'm going to vaccinate you. That's a joke about uh, uh, a lot, how a lot of homeschooled kids are uh, very sheltered by their parents. Um, they're sheltered from school and experiences, and as well as usually they're sheltered from um, public health. So uh, if, if you guys are homeschooled and you got vaccinated, let me know in the comments section and uh, let me know what it was like to be disowned by your parents. I'll do it. I, I went to music school um, mostly because uh, it was almost entirely paid for by the government. Uh, not because I'm so good at the piano, it's because I am uh, medically stupid. Um, I'm actually so dumb, the government just paid for everything. It's incredible. Classic Canada. <laughs> so all, all of Americans who watch this, um, you guys might not know, but in Canada, um, the government will pay for almost everything for you. Uh, at all times. You just have to ask. It was a strange journey to get this. Uh, I was uh, at, at a harmony class, uh, like a music theory exam, and uh, I did really badly on the test. And uh, in the hallway, uh, a bassoon professor approached me, and they were like, um, Miles, have you ever had your, uh, your brain uh, looked at? <laughs> and that's a real low point in your life when a bassoon professor it's like, you might be insane. And I was like, no. And then she was like, well, you know, if, if they find you, you know, you have some disabilities, you might be eligible for grant money. And I was like, I am scheduling an appointment right now. Uh, actually, as we speak. So I had an appointment with a neuropsychologist and they did a nine hour neuropsychological examination of me. And they asked me all sorts of bizarre questions. Uh, he was like, uh, what, what are you most afraid of in life? And I was like, mountain lions for sure. Um, Great callback. And then he would write in his little notebook for a long time. And he was like, what are your plans for the future? And I'm like, I don't know, I'm only 24. And he's like, no, oh, right? And I had this whole exam. At the end of the exam, uh, I got the results back. And uh, he had them in a big, thick file. And he says, Miles, uh, the results are in, and uh, yeah, you're going to be getting that grant. Um, <laughs> the joke is that Miles is stupid. Again, a bit of a self-own, which is not great for business comedy, but it is good for comedy comedy. Also, you may have an IQ as low as 86. <laughs> How do you feel about this? And I was like, out of a <laughs> hundred? The joke here is that Miles is stupid. So I got my grant and I'm so happy and I... I'm sitting at home and I get a letter in the mail from the doctor and uh, it's an invoice for the uh, exam. It's $2,000. And I was like, oh my God. Like, I don't know how I'm gonna pay this. And I got so mad, I couldn't believe it was so expensive. I thought this was gonna be paid for, you know, I'm, I'm disabled. And... <laughs> I 
I'm pacing around inside my grandma's house thinking about what the hell's going on. I began to question if this guy's a real doctor, you know? It took a real brain exam because I'm thinking, you know, halfway through this exam, this guy should have been thinking to himself, there's no way Miles has $2,000. <laughs> and by the end of the exam, he should have been realizing there's no way Miles will ever have $2,000. <laughs> So I, I just, I got it in my head, I, you know, I said, you know what, I'm going to issue my own uh, IQ exam for this doctor. It's my own uh, test to him. Uh, my test is, can this uh, smart doctor get $2,000 out of a man with an 86 IQ? And uh, so far it's been 10 years, so checkmate, Dr. Dum Dum. Thank you so much, ladies and gentlemen. You've been so lovely. Thank you all for coming out. All right, there it is. Uh, that was the stand-up special by comedian Miles Anderson. Uh, a lot of the, the crux of the jokes uh, were that he's from a, a Vancouver Island in the forest and that he is um, very dumb and very poor. Uh, so kind of self-deprecating, um, but, you know, which isn't great for brand building, but he is, uh, you know, it was very funny. The crowd loved it. Um, it's one of the best uh, uh, stupid, poor comedians working today, for sure. Um, if you guys want to check out more of that special, it's out on uh, 800 Pound Gorilla's YouTube channel. Um, or, you know, of course, you can just uh, Google search Miles Anderson and just find all of the, the really stupid and poor things that he has done over the last 25 years. So, uh, thanks so much for watching, guys. If uh, you guys want to see more videos like this, uh, we'll be back with more Jokes Explained in the future. Um, again, like and subscribe. Leave a comment below if you thought Miles was gay for the first half of this special. Thanks so much for watching, guys, and I'll see you in the next one.